Now, last week, I uh, gave you two supreme principles, and I want to begin today's lecture with the supreme principle in relation to the understanding. This is a good starting point for the <coughs> issue before us today, which is the synthetic unity of our perception. It's a very difficult part of the first critique. We want to be systematically exploring it. The supreme principle in relation to understanding is to quote Kant, that all the manifold of intuition should be subject to conditions of the original synthetic unity of apperception. That's one of those wonderful passages in the first critique that has eyes roll up, people read it a second and third time, consulted in German, consulted in Japanese, and, and uh, trying to get through it. But he does lay out the argument that clarifies what he means by this, and he attaches central importance to what is claimed regarding the synthetic unity of our perception. In fact, he goes so far as to say that the synthetic unity of our perception is, quote, the highest point to which we must ascribe all employment of the understanding. It's the pinnacle. I continue with the quote. Even the whole of logic and conformably therewith, transcendental philosophy itself. The quote continues, Indeed, this faculty of apperception is the understanding itself. You'll find that at B134. So, how does he wish to have this synthetic unity understood? It's not subjective, it's not some psychological state. Kant says this, the synthetic unity of consciousness is an objective condition of all knowledge. It is not merely a condition that I myself require in knowing an object, but as a condition under which every intuition must stand in order to become an object for me. Now this is addressed to the question of how various sensations become integrated and unified in consciousness and then how it is that it inheres in my or your consciousness and how all of this should be understood as distinct from mere subjectivity or psychological states. Well, step back for a moment and consider what's been, what has been established so far. If there are to be concepts at all, there must be some means by which to fashion them out of representations. Thus, some sort of categorical framework is necessary if entities are to be cognized as objects at all. Kant's table of categories, therefore, must match up with the properties that enter into anything standing as intersubjectively stable identifications, things that are universally agreed to by percipients of a certain kind. For it's only by way of these categories that objects can be conceptualized at all. And recall that additional resources are required if there is to be knowledge, for understanding is grounded in rules, in, in an innate faculty that benefits from practice, but is at base the gift of Mother Wit. Mother Wit, yes. She's back. <laughs> well, so far so good. But just when this seems to be the last word, as progress is tracked from sensation to objective knowledge, something new and seemingly psychological enters into the equation, if there are to be concepts at all, namely apperception and its shadowy relatives, which Kant identifies as the empirical ego, a transcendental ego, and a self. <clears throat> this uh, matter of selves has, has whiskers, uh, as Professor Williams was among the first to uh, remind all of us a number of years ago. 
to have a pause between cigars, that's all. So with a body that's constantly undergoing change, the question arises, how is there a continuity of self, a continuity of the ego? Now the scholastic philosophers were more or less content, following either Plato or Aristotle on this, that there is an essential self, there is an essential being, that undergoes alteration, but not change. That unless there is some enduring substance that just is the self, there really wouldn't be anything for the engines of change to be working on. And so an essentialism comes out of this. When Aristotle says famously that the sense in which Periscus is musical is different from the sense in which Periscus is a man, He's pointing to the difference between some accidental properties that we acquire in the course of a lifetime and some essential properties in virtue of which we are the kinds of things that we are. The medieval part of this story, well, the scholastic part of this story, is itself a very interesting part of the story, but we've got to move on regrettably. And we move to Locke. Now, when you read Locke's essay concerning the human understanding and are told in 40 secondary sources that this is his broadside against Descartes' theory of innate ideas, keep two things in mind. The theory of innate ideas ascribed to Descartes, Descartes publicly denied, in print, he never attached himself to any such notion as that. And secondly, Descartes isn't discussed by Locke, though we have every reason to believe that during his period of self-exile, Locke surely read what Descartes had to say. I believe the right target here is probably the Cambridge Platonists, so surely more more than Descartes. And the Cambridge Platonists, Cudworth, Moore, and company, were actually gainfully employed in reviving Platonist thought in philosophy in the Anglophone, very much, uh, very much in opposition to the sorts of things that we would identify with a Baconian, Newtonian perspective on reality and on knowledge. So, so Locke has a project when it comes to this, and the project is going that at a certain point we'll, we'll focus on this notion of a substantial or essential self, and on essences more generally. And that's when we find Locke declaring that you must make a distinction between real essences and nominal essences. You don't know the real essence of anything. The real essence is going to be at some Newtonian corpuscular level to which you do not have perceptual access. And as far as nominal essences go, these are entirely the gift of convention. That one chooses to call this tissue is, is, a, is, is a fact that arises in a given cultural context, historical context. We can imagine cultures and settings and people and languages where where whatever it is we're trying to get out with the word tissue would not be what they were trying to get out with an entirely different word. As Locke points out, you could constitute something physically indistinguishable from Locke, but much cleverer than Locke. And, and you might go about describing that entity in terms quite different from the ones you'd use for Locke. And to illustrate the point, he gives us the famous instance of the prince and the cobbler. What, after all, goes into one's selfhood, personal identity, continuing ego, etc.? Well, simply all of the things present in your consciousness. And since nothing now present in your consciousness is actually based on something happening now, we can say that consciousness is just the repository of all the things that you remember from milliseconds ago to hours and days and years and months ago. 
Well, do this as a thought experiment. On a given night, a prince and a cobbler go to sleep. In the course of the night, the contents of the prince's consciousness are transferred to the cobbler. The contents of the cobbler's consciousness are transferred to the prince. And Locke says, quite persuasively, that on their, uh, on their arising, I grant you, quote, they are the same man, but not the same person. And you, you, you can, here's this uh, shoe cobbler who expects you to be <laughs> Relata. You, you, you'd enjoy it. But for the first serious uh, philosophical critique of the thesis, we turn to George Barclay and to Barclay's Alciphron. And Barclay's Alciphron, along with Thomas Reed's Inquiry, puts to the test the notion that you have exhausted uh, this concept of an enduring self by consulting no more than what the empiricists offer by way of the contents of consciousness. The argument is fairly straightforward. It's sometimes called the brave officer argument. And the brave officer argument is in the following form. Imagine a brave officer, call him B, who recalls vividly having been a boy once punished for stealing fruit from the orchard, called the young boy A. Now consider many years hence a decorated general, reflecting on the day he was decorated as a young officer, called the aged general C who has a vivid recollection of being the young officer B and no recollection whatever of being the boy A. On the Lockean account, it would seem that A equals B, B equals C, but A does not equal C. The principle of associativity is not honored and the alleged identity collapses. Now, just in case you think that what Locke was offering is some sort of identity argument, that would be a successful challenge to it. Reed, as you might guess, has that challenge and then another one. The other one is quintessentially Reedian. The other one is that someone remembers having done something. No more makes him the one who did it. You, you have lunatics seven days a week vividly recalling having lost a battle in Belgium. They stand there with their hands inside their waistcoat. They affect a French accent. They wonder why the supplies came so late. They're from Portsmouth. <laughs> so, so Reed simply, he says, that this is what happens. Uh, there's a wonderful line of Reed's that conjectures and theories are the creatures of men. Uh, and nature seldom mimics these things, do you see? So, so when I say that my epitaph shall read, he died without a theory, I, I'm, I'm, I'm simply showing a very strong sympathy for a Scottish common sense philosophy that thinks we're generally, generally safe when we stick to systematic observation, when possible, measurement, and framing very modest propositions based on what is available to persons of ordinary perception. And that the further we get from that, the more turbid and turbulent the waters of metaphysics as they 